Hey everyone, thanks for joining me up to play games. My name is Lance, and today I'm teaching you how to play Nocturnian. This is a new game from Vesuvius Media. It is a two to four player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play, and is a competitive game. So each player is going to be competing against the other players to have the most points to be the overall winner at the end of the game. Please also make sure that you have your Klingon text turned on, and if you do, you should have a little text at the bottom of the screen. This way I can update you throughout the video if there's any rules corrections that need that I need to point out, or any other important information throughout the video. If you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider the like button subscribing to my channel, as it really does make a big difference, helps me to continue to grow and produce these videos. And if you'll stay updated on all my videos, also considering the bell so you get notifications anytime I release new content. So let's head to the table, and I'll teach you guys how to play. So the first thing I want to go over are the different resources and tokens you're going to receive. So if you have the deluxe version, you'll have these upgraded tokens that are cast and metal coins and that. And if you have the standard version, then you're going to have just the cardboard cutouts. So I want to go through both of those so you're familiar with them. So the first one we have are these six main resources in the game, which are wood, gold, knights, wizards, stone, and arcane archers. Then we have the three primary tokens that are going to be used throughout the game, which are the Sacred Chalice, the Guildmaster token, and the Crown of Authority token. And then there's also three different resources in the game for prestige. We have one point value, five point values, and ten point values. The first set of cards we have here are the beast cards. Each one of these cards at the top of the card is going to list the beast's name, the number of prestige points you'll gain when summoning the beast, and the affiliated resource that, that beast is attached to, as well as the resource you must discard in order to summon the beast, unless another condition is met, which I'll go into a little bit later. Finally, there are going to be four different conditions for the beast's effects, which we have summon, reaction, discard, and gather. Each beast is going to be able to manipulate your die based on its arrow, so some beasts will be able to manipulate it up one point, and some will be able to manipulate it down one point. Anytime you use one of these, you're going to place an exhausted marker on it as each beast can only be used once per round to manipulate a die. And you can use multiple beasts to manipulate the same die up that value or down that value. And each of the die that you manipulate can only go up to six and only go down to one. Finally, each beast is also going to have a condition that can be triggered. Some of them will be triggered when they're summoned. Some of them will have reactions that will trigger based on something. You have to discard some beasts in order to trigger their effects. And finally, there will be even one beast that you'll be triggered based on when something is gathered. The second set of cards we have here are the curse cards. And there's going to be a number of different ways players will be able to gain these throughout the game. A player can only have a maximum of three curses at any time, so if a player receives a fourth curse, they're going to choose one of their three existing curses to discard and then gain the fourth. Now there's a couple of cards that are also throwing players, and I'd like to go into detail on those. So the first one here says to keep this curse and discard it instead of gathering any resource next round. What this means is the next time you would gather a resource, instead you're going to discard this card and not gain that resource. Now, if the times two marker is pointing towards a resource that you would gain, instead of gaining two, you would only gain one of that resource, as this would take care of the other one, but you would still gain one. The next one we have are the bloodthirst curses. And with these, the more of them you have at the end of the game, the worse you're going to be. As you can see on this chart here, the more of them you have, the more prestige points you're going to lose. The final one we have here is your summoning limit is going to be reduced by one. So normally you can summon up to four beasts in your menagerie. With this one, it would reduce that by one, so you would only have a maximum of three. So if you already have four beasts, then yes, you do have to discard a beast immediately in order to meet the requirements of this curse. Each house in the game is also going to have three heirlooms that they're going to be able to build throughout the game to give them prestige points and are also going to give them special abilities on their card and will allow them to complete quests as you're going to see in this next step. Now each heirloom is going to have a name and there's going to be three different ones. We have helmets, torsos, and legs. Each heirloom is also going to be worth a number of prestige points when it is built and each heirloom will have a, the resources that are needed to spend in order to bring that heirloom into play. The final set of cards we have are the quest cards, and there's going to be three levels of quests, level 1, 2, and 3. Each of the quests is going to list the name of that quest at the top, the number of prestige points it will grant when completed, 
the resources and types of resources you'll need to complete the quest and the ability or resource you're going to gain immediately when completing that quest. And there's a quick reference guide here as you can see. And each one of these quests is going to get more difficult, requiring more resources, and will grant potentially more victory points. As you can see as they progress, this one having a lot of resource requirements, but also gaining a number of prestige points. And the other important thing to point out with these is that it, these are going to be based on the heirlooms that you have unlocked. So you can't go on quests, level 1 quests, until you have one heirloom. You can't go on level 2 quests until you have two and you can't go on level three quests until you have all three heirlooms unlocked on your house's board. There'll also be 12 location tiles included in the game. Each of these tiles will have a name of that location at the top, the resource that location generates, a special ability that location grants the player that activates it, and finally in the bottom section here is a spot that your player will have to play a die in order to activate that location. If a location has a die on it, it has been activated. If it does not, then it has not been activated yet. There is also going to be seven different abilities that you'll find on these tiles, and there's a quick reference guide on the back of the rule book to help you along with these, and I'll go into more detail about that during the game. And the last thing I want to go over before moving into setup is a quick breakdown of the board. So on the board is broken down into four different districts. Each district will have three locations that you'll be placing location tiles on later. Each of the districts is also going to have two numbers for the dice that you'll be able to place in there to activate one of those locations, and it must match the number on that district. Then in the central area, the board is going to be a tracker to track the number of rounds, and it'll end the game based on the number of players that are playing. And then we have the four seasons, and each season is going to contain one of each of the six different resources. So we have winter, spring, summer, and fall and this will continue and each time the tracker completes a circuit you'll move the marker up one space on the number of rounds then finally we have locations for the monster deck and the curse deck for board setup go ahead and place the board out in the middle of the table and then go ahead and grab the 12 location tiles and shuffle them up and then you can place one out in each one of the locations around the board once you've done that, then each location has a resource that's attached with it, so go ahead and place a one resource on each of those locations matching its resource type. Next, go ahead and place the Guildmaster token in the Lumber Yard and the, chal the Sacred Chalice on the Monastery. And then go ahead and place out the resources and the Prestige tokens somewhere on the board. And for this video, I'll be using the Crystal Fortress pod sets. If you want to find out more about them, there'll be a link in the description below. You can also place out all the dice you're going to be using for this game and the resource tracker as well and the round tracker can be placed on the first round to start the game. Go ahead and shuffle up the curse deck and place that out on its location as well as the beast deck. Go ahead and do the same thing with that. Then separate each one of the quest decks and place that out on the board in its section. And you can reveal three quests as well for that. And the final step is to select the first player to be the starting player, and you can do this in any manner you want. So I'm going to have our player down here be the starting player, and he'll receive the crown of authority. Then starting with that player and proceeding around the board in a clockwise manner, each player is going to gather a player board of their noble house. And the starting player will choose first, so he's going to go ahead and take the blue noble house, and the other player will play green. Each player is also going to get the three heirloom cards of their faction, each player is going to receive five exhaustion tokens, and then each player is also going to be dealt three beast cards to be their starting hands. From there, we're ready to begin the game. Nocturnian is played over an undefined number of rounds, and during each round, each player is going to get to take a turn. This is going to continue until the designated number of seasons based on the number of players is complete, at which point the player that has the most prestige points will be the overall winner of the game. Each round of the game is broken into three phases, which are the acquisition phase, the action phase, and the refresh phase. And I'm going to take you through each one of these. So at the start of each round, it will start with the acquisition phase. So during this phase, the player that has the crown of authority is going to gather up a number of dice based on the number of players that are playing. So with our game, we're playing with two players, so there'll be two dice. And then each player that is able to generate additional dice due to meeting the requirements on their board based on the number of 
of heirlooms that they have or other effects such as monsters or quests that they've completed will add additional dice to that. So currently we only have the two, but say for example that one of our players had all three heirlooms, then they would also generate an additional die that would be added to that. So at this point, like I said, we'll only have the two, so we'll go ahead and give those a roll. And then starting with the player, the, the first player, each player is going to select one die. So our first player will go ahead and take the six and place it in his treasury without changing its side. Then the other player will gather the other die. If there was additional dice then, each player that was able to gain an additional die due to those effects would also be able to select one from that in clockwise order again, starting with the first player. The second phase in the round is the action phase, and during this phase the players are going to get to perform a number of different actions, including reserving a die, equipping heirlooms, activating locations, activating abilities, and going on quests. And the players are going to be able to do these actions in any order that they want, and in as many times as they want. However, they may never end their action phase with any dice in their treasury. If and only if there are no available locations to activate and you already have a die in reserve, you may discard a die to get any one resource from the supply and then you're going to move the season tracker to the next relevant resource space on the calendar. This phase is always going to start with the first player and proceed in a clockwise manner until all players have completed their actions. So the one other thing I want to point out before moving into the individual player actions is that each player's board you're going to have to designate one side of it to be your treasury. And this is where you're going to keep all of your different cards, your dice that are in your treasury, and any resources that you gather throughout the game. This is going to be important for a number of different things that are going to come up. So for our player here, they have their treasury on this side of their board. From there, let's go ahead and move into the individual actions a player can perform during their turn, starting with the reserving a die. So in order to do this, the player is going to take one of their die from their treasury and add it on top of their family crest on their player board without changing the number of that die. The player can only do this one time during their turn, and if for some reason a card or effect or quest allows them to do this again, instead of doing that, instead of placing the die, they're going to gain a resource from the supply of their choice. A player can also equip an heirloom at any point during their turn as long as they have the resources required for that heirloom. So let's go ahead and say for example that our player had a stone and he just acquired the arcane bow. So at this point he does meet the requirements for the torso which requires one stone and one arrow so we'll go ahead and discard these back to the supply and then we can equip this by placing it in his spot on his heirlooms on the top of his player board. Then we can gain the number of prestige as listed on there, so we'll gain one prestige token for that. And when we unlock the heirlooms, we'll also unlock any bonuses that are listed on our player board that is specialized to our house. So initially, nobody will get any bonuses for only having one heirloom unlocked, but as we unlock the other ones, then we'll also receive bonuses for that. And the one other important thing is unlocking heirlooms will allow us to go on quests now as well. So since we have one heirloom completed, we can go on level one quests. A player can also choose to activate a location as long as he has a die in his treasury that matches one of the two numbers on the district of the location he wishes to activate. So let's say, for example, that our player wants to activate the mine and he does have a six in his treasury. So in order to activate it, he has to place the die on that location. Once he does that, then that location is considered activated. Up until that point, any location that does not have a die on it currently is considered inactive. Now, if this is the very first die placed during the very first round by the very first player, then he will take the season tracker and place it on the resource of that location starting on the winter track. So with this being stone, he would place this on the stone with the two always pointing up and away from the outside of that perimeter and the little horse and wagon on the inside of that perimeter. So it would go on this very top row on the resource matching the location that is activated. Now if this is not, if this is any other time during the game, then the player is going to move it to that resource. So let's go ahead and say, for example, instead we activated the weaponsmith or the worksmith so then we would move the track to the next sword icon. So if this one was already taken, then we would move it all the way over to this next part of the track. From there, then we would move on to step two, where we are going to take a look at where the horse and buggy are pointing, which is pointing to this district, which means that any location on the district that does not have a resource, so let's say, for example, that somebody had gone there before, 
would now get that resource back. So we would take a resource from the supply matching that location and placing it back on there. In this way, that is how the locations are going to regain the resources. And then the final step is that our player will gather any resource that is on the location that he activated. If there is not a, a resource on that location, then he would not gain any resources from that location. And then finally, we're going to take a look at where the times two is pointing. So if the times two had been pointing down into this district and we gained a resource from there, we would gain one from the location if it has one, and then we'd also gain one from the, the supply. So we would gain two in that situation, as shown by the times two. Now, since it is up here, then he would not gain the multiplier as that is pointing up to the north district. But let's go ahead and go back down to where we were so we had gotten the stone so we'll gain that stone and add it to our treasury and then at this point then the final step in the round is an optional step where we can activate that location's special ability so this particular one will allow us to summon a beast from our hand so we would be able to look at the different beasts in our hands and as long as we have the resource matching it or if we're at a location that has the same resource as a beast that we have in our hand we can choose to play that beast without having to spend that resource the other option we have with this particular one is that we could draw three beasts from the deck and choose one to keep. Now there's a quick reference on the back of the rule book that explains each one of the icons that are on these different locations as there are seven different ones and each one of them is pretty basic so I'm not going to go through each one of these in detail. A player can also choose to activate any abilities he's unlocked on his player board or any beasts that he has in his menagerie. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of this. Let's go ahead and say that our player had unlocked a couple heirlooms and had been able to gain an ability. So now that he has two heirlooms unlocked, he has this middle ability that he can use to manipulate a die to any number, and that'd be a die in his treasury. In order to do this, he has to place an exhausted token on that ability, and then he can change that die to any number. Now also, as players will gain beasts in their menagerie, they can activate their abilities. And each monster or each beast is going to have two different things it can activate. You can activate its number manipulation, which will allow you to change a number plus one or minus one based on which direction the arrow is going. So with our Emerald Tiger here, we can reduce the die by one value so we can change this six to a five. Now you can never increase a die beyond six or decrease a die below six. And you can activate this multiple times in a turn. So let's say that, for example, we had these cards equipped and we needed a four. We could use an exhaust token on each of those beasts to change our die down to four as both of them have the downward arrow. Now we can also choose to activate a beast and use its special ability. So with this one, we have the gargoyle. Its reaction will let us gain a resource of the same type as that currently being gathered. So we could choose to exhaust it to do that ability and trigger it. Each beast can only be exhausted one time during the turn. So we can either choose to use its die ability or its special ability. And if a beast is exhausted, then you cannot discard it if it has a discard effect. And if all four of your beasts are exhausted, you cannot discard one to add a new beast. And the last type of action our player can do is to go on a quest during their turn. And again, they can do this any number of times as long as they have the resources to spend to complete those quests and they have the required heirlooms unlocked to go on those quests. So in order to go on a level one quest, you have to have at least one heirloom unlocked. To go on a level two quest, you have to have two. And to go on the level three quests, you have to have all three of your heirlooms unlocked. So with our player, we'll go ahead and say that we have one heirloom unlocked so we can go on level one quests. In order to do that, then let's go ahead and say that we have the resources needed. We have a bow and the wood in our treasury. So we'll add those to our treasury and then we'll choose to go on this quest. So the first thing we'll do is discard those resources that were required. Then we will gain the number of prestige points of that quest. So we'll gain one prestige point that is added to our treasury. And then finally, we can choose to activate the special ability on the bottom of that quest. So with this one, it lets us summon a beast from our hands to our menagerie without discarding the resource required. So we'll go ahead and add the Emerald Tiger. So again, we would gain another prestige point for that. So we'll add that. And then finally, this is going to go ahead and be discarded off of the table. Then as long as there are, is still a deck of cards for that quest, you can restock the quest by flipping over a new quest card. 
If there are no cards left from the level one quests, then the deck is not reshuffled. The players will not be able to go on that level quest anymore. So now that I've taken you through all the different players' actions, let's go ahead and put it all together and show you an example of a player's turn. So again, we'll start with the first player and proceed around the table with each player getting to take their turn. So over with our first player here, he doesn't, initially we don't have a lot to do, so there won't be too much in this, but he does have one die that he can choose to activate a location with. So let's go ahead and do that. We will activate, let's see what kind of a beast we have. All right, so let's go ahead and activate the, let's go activate the gold location up here. So we'll place our die matching one of the die at that district and then we'll place the marker as it has not been placed yet and it'll be placed on gold so then we will gain the resources we'll gain one for that and then we are pointing the times two up into that district so we'll gain a second resource from the supply adding them both to our treasury now we do not have a beast of that type so we couldn't summon a beast as that is the special ability of the location that allows us to summon a beast so if we wanted to we could still summon a beast but we would have to pay the resource of that beast, and since we don't have one, we cannot do that. From there, our player does not have the resources required to get an heirloom, and he doesn't have an heirloom unlocked to go on a quest yet, and we don't have any beasts to activate, and we are out of dice, so that is the end of our turn for this player, and then we would proceed to the next player to take their turn. I'd like to take you through one more example, so I've gone ahead and rearranged things for a later turn example to show you a little bit more of, of a player's turn. So again, we're going to go ahead and start with our player over here to start his turn, and so he's going to go ahead and start by manipulating a die. So he's going to place an exhausted marker on the Emerald Tiger to reduce one of his die down one point to four. Then he's going to go ahead and spin that die to activate the Arcanum, and he will have to move the tracker to the next space. And then from there, then he's going to replenish any resources in there. So we have a stone that's missing and a sword. And then he's going to go ahead and gather the resource. Now our other player is going to step in real quick and exhaust one of his beasts that is going to curse that player when he takes a resource during winter, which we are currently in as our player moved that up. So our player is going to have to draw the top curse card. And so you're, this is a curse that is going to reduce your summit limit by one. So at this point, then we could not summon another beast as our menagerie would be considered full. Then our player will gather the resources from that location. And he is not on the times two multiplier as that is pointing up top. From there, then he'll resolve the effect on that location. And that lets him exchange one of his resources for any other resource. So he's going to exchange a sword for another wood. Then he's going to go ahead and complete this quest up here. It's going to require a stone, a magic, and two wood. So we'll place those back in the supply and then gather that quest up. So first off, the quest is going to give him four prestige points. So we'll gather those. And then it is also going to give him a resource of his choice. So he's going to go ahead and take a wood back. We can place this off to the side as it won't be used anymore, and then we'll replace that with a new quest. Then our player is going to go ahead and spend the resources to complete the last heirloom, and it's going to require a gold and a wood. Then we'll place that in there, and we'll also gain a prestige point for that. And our player is going to finish off by going up here and doing this location. Then he's going to move it, so he'll move the marker. Uh, this location is already replenished, and then he will gain the resources. So he'll get two swords as the multiplier is there. And he also can take the chalice or eliminate a curse. So we're going to go ahead and just eliminate the curse and place that on the bottom of the curse deck. That's pretty much all our player can do for this round, so then it would pass to the next player to take his turn. And the final phase in the round is the refresh phase, which will take place after all players have taken their turns. So during the refresh phase, you're going to take all of the dice off their locations and return them to the supply. Then each player that has more than, than six resources in their treasury must discard down to six, and this can be any resource of their choice, as long as they have a maximum of six resources. 
Then in player order, each player is going to either discard or draw up to three beasts into their hands so that they have a hand size of three beast cards. If a player had the Guildmaster token in their treasury, then they can take the Crown of Authority token. And if no player has the Guildmaster token, then the Crown of Authority token is going to pass clockwise to the next player. And whoever has the Crown of Authority is going to be the first player for that round. If a player had the Guildmaster token, then that is going to be returned to the Lumber Mill. Then each player is going to remove all exhausted tokens on their Beast Cards and Noble House Ability spots. Any player that has a reserve die on their crest is going to move it to their treasury now. And if the year tracker has reached the last year, then you're going to go ahead and proceed to the end of the game. Otherwise, the current round ends and a new one begins. And if there are any beasts in the supply, go ahead and discard those at this point. The final thing I want to go over is the round tracker itself. So each time the round tracker moves from the, the autumn to a new winter round, you're going to move the tracker of 1-4 four space forward on the your tracker. So when this reaches the final spot based on the number of players that are playing, so it, with us playing two players, when it reaches the fourth round, that will trigger the final round. So what that means is the game is not going to end immediately. The players will continue so that all players have had an equal number of turns. And then at the end of that round, the players will move into a scoring phase. At that point, each player is going to total up all of their prestige points subtract any negatives based on any curses those players have that provide negatives to prestige, and then the player with the most points will be the overall winner of the game. Well, I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. As always, if you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button subscribing to my channel as it really does make a big difference, helps me to continue to grow and produce these videos. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.